And now I'm just going to do a quick run through siting and design of how these cells and these facilities kind of show up in the landscape and on projects. Hopefully what you will glean from, from this subset of possibilities is that uh, they can look many, 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 many different ways. It's a very adaptable approach. Designers can apply a lot of creativity to integrate these facilities into projects well, uh, but just a some uh, sense of where these facilities might be located. Um, on a residential parcel, sure, we can have a rain garden on our single-family residential lot. We can have them out maybe more like a landscaped area or in a more dense site, like Curtis mentioned, that project in Seattle, that little little tiny structured a rain garden that can be done in planters. So the right-of-way, they can be in curb bulb outs, as we see, achieving some traffic calming and some other urban design goals. Locating them in planter strips, or like the example we're seeing here between the sidewalk and the back of curb. A landscape median that we may want to have, well, we can grade it so that the stormwater goes there versus being high and dry like a typical median. And then within commercial par parcels, uh, within landscaped areas, a parking lot is going to be one of your most straightforward applications. It's going to be your most cost-effective stormwater treatment practice, bar none, is to replace landscaping that you would have built anyway with bioretention, hands down, regardless of soil type, going to be your cheapest way to go, or in dedicated planters or, you know, in among buildings. These are some examples of kind of what a rain garden could look like in a residential setting. This is just one way it can look. These are very expansive, and but you can see the vegetated zones, the saturated zones, the non-saturated zones and all the planting and the structures there. But like as we can see, the minimum requirements one through five can be met with rain gardens, but not six or seven. Six and seven, of course, are the uh, water quality treatment and flow control. Those must be met with bioretention designed according to the manual. Uh, here's those examples I was mentioning of what a little planter can look like in a single family setting and then see streets and show how the what is really our region's first bioretention retrofit was done and what it looked like. So for those of you who don't uh, know the story, uh, these were installed at that time for salmon protection. To benefit the salmon in Piper's Creek, it was desired to put in some green stormwater. So there's a block on the left there. You can see it pre and post. And a curvilinear road alignment was installed there, making space for bioretention cells. And so there was the full complement of neighborhood discussions about the integration of these facilities into an existing neighborhood. But the result there you can see is uh, reduced pavement width and the introduction of these vegetated facilities along the road the incorporation of this curvilinear road layout, uh, which kind of, I think, made the design interesting. And so, yeah, that's one of the region's first. Another one on the left is an old favorite, one of the first in the region of a curb bulb out approach, where Portland, for now for combined sewer overflow purposes, was going back into neighborhoods and inserting into the flow line of the gutter these vegetated facilities, which also act as traffic calming. Possible to excavate existing pavement, change the curb line, direct water that's coming down the gutter anyway, reconfigure the catch basin that may be located at the corner anyway to be an overflow structure, and there you go, you've now inserted some flow control and treatment into your existing system, similar to the other project on the right, where it's just another a version on a theme. You can also see this one on, on the right has an interesting characteristic of being a flow through, where it can be very, very simple if, if you don't have a catch basin, say, at the corner to reconfigure. It can be really, really simple to have a curb cut inlet and have a curb cut overflow. What comes in infiltrates and gets treated. What doesn't uh, overflows and returns to the gutter. And so this can be a pretty cost-effective way to insert some treatment and flow control into the existing urban environment. Moving up the scale in terms of urban installations, these are other retrofits, these now coming in from Portland. Portland really has a pretty mature program of putting these facilities into the urban environment, sidewalk in the back of curb. What's interesting to note in, in these two cases, uh, what makes them different, and this is something that we talk quite a bit about in the advanced version of this course. So you'll notice on the left, we've got vegetation right up to the back of the curb. We've got our curb cuts, and that's because there's no parking on the example on the left. And so we don't need to have that two foot courtesy zone to have somebody so they can step out of their vehicle. Whereas on the right, where we do have adjacent parking, then we want to provide that two foot courtesy zone so that someone can get out of their car without being ankle deep in a bioretention cell. And so you can see then that the detailing of these two examples, there's a lot of uh, variations and different creative ways to do this, but you can see the use of a trench drain uh, on the right to kind of be a little bridge over that. This is something we go into in, in great levels of, of depth and detail 
know in the advanced uh, course. Of Looking at this then at a, at a kind of a large scale, another very notable project in our region that those of you who have been following this for any length of time, but it was really the region's first large scale deployment of low impact development or green stormwater infrastructure uh, on the redevelopment of the High Point housing site. This was an affordable housing project of Seattle Housing Authority in West Seattle, uh, where the design, uh, original design without low impact development uh, required a very large storm pond. And you can see in that aerial there is a remnant storm pond still in the design. You can see that little kidney shaped thing in the lower right. That pond uh, in the final design was significantly smaller than it was in the original design because of the uh, use of, of low impact development. And so we're just going to kind of look at some of these examples. Looking at the block level, you can see the kind of very generous planting strip here between the sidewalk and back of curb filled with bioretention, showing it inundated. This is another picture uh, showing uh, the inundation of the bioretention cells. Bioretention was integrated with a whole series of previous pavement and to really uh, drive down the size of that, of that pond. So the question is about pre-treatment prior to enter of the bioretention cell, and the, the comment was about some jurisdictions are requiring that. Pre-treatment prior to entering the bioretention cell is always a good idea. It's not always required by your jurisdiction, and maybe if your contributing area is relatively small, you may not decide it's necessary, but the system will perform significantly better if you have, like you said, a filter strip or a little pre-settling basin or structure uh, ahead of the cell. And then just wanted to look a little bit at commercial scale, so we looked at a couple of residential settings. There's, they look a little bit different in the commercial setting. So right off the bat, you know, while not being specifically a low impact development BMP, uh, thinking about interesting conveyance, surface conveyance with runnels and weirs and rain chains and ways to celebrate the movement of water and to work the movement of water into the design will make the aesthetics of the project significantly greater and will also, by doing more interesting surface conveyance, uh, can probably make your bioretention cells more feasible in a lot more locations because you're keeping that water relatively shallow and that it's not two feet down in a pipe, which you then have to deal with. Uh, and so we want to think about conveyance and using surface conveyance where we can. And then just kind of looking into some examples. This is another Seattle example. Now over in uh, Northgate at the Thornton Creek, Salmon Bearing Creek for Seattle. This was a retrofit done in the Northgate Mall by SVR. They went in and retrofitted the existing mall parking lot with bioretention cells to facilitate infiltration and protection of the creek. So we can see here various widths used for the cell there on the left. You can see it's a little bit narrower up top, getting slightly larger parking stalls than more down at the tail end here, slightly larger where they're using these, these compact stalls. With The width varies in that they're using gutter and they've got their gutter inlet in the image on the right, a big uh, generous bioretention cell there at the end. And so just some images, some drawings of that same project to notice in the image by using curb stops and having those curb stops right there at the top of the cell, we really let the bumper overhang happen over the cell. Uh, that's just a way to get a little more width out of the situation, but then if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you're adequately protecting that pavement edge. More pictures of Northgate kind of showing the curb cut inlets with their erosion protection of those inlets up in the curb cuts in the top part of the image and then also around the overflow structure. You know, this is also an interesting one because it's, it's, it's on a slope, it's not level because this was a retrofit situation. But it's particularly challenging, I think, in the design of these and something that I think is, is problematic, especially on small cells, is to really facilitate the ponding depth in Designs that I've been part of, one of the Achilles heels they've had has, sometimes it's been a construction issue, sometimes it's been the geometry and topography of the site wouldn't allow it, but really facilitating a true six inch ponding depth before we get to the overflow. And so this is not in any way criticism of this design. I think it's just a common challenge, especially like, they're, like this uh, project is doing here in this retrofit situation, to really facilitate that ponding depth and to not just have mulch right up to the rim where water tends to run in, run out a lot faster than if we force it into that, have that force it into that ponding uh, situation so it really drives the water down through the media and doesn't just run out. So can, uh, out here at a uh, couple of project in Bellevue on the left, some bioretention woven in with some retaining walls. I'm not 
completely certain where the bar, I think it's in that middle area there. But certainly on the right image, we see a very generous bioretention with kind of this radial inlets all the way around the outside with curb cuts going through their C-curb there with little erosion protection. Question is, how big is too big for a bioretention cell? And um, in general, we want these systems much more distributed than a big honk and central one down at the low corner of the site, like we would have a traditional detention pond. There's no legal upper limit on the size. Different correction factors will come in when we start to get over those contributing area thresholds. Uh, but that one on the right there, really on the upper limit, or maybe a little past of what I think these days we would, but, it, but if that's the space you have available and, and there's no other alternative, then, then by all means. But we generally speaking, want these facilities to be relatively small and distributed, catching small catchment areas throughout the site. When they get very, very large, other problems start to emerge, like even distribution of flow, you know, uh, they tend to short circuit and all the infiltration happens in one small spot and other things emerge that really drive us to want to have them be relatively small and distributed. So here's a case where we've got a sloping site where they chose not to use the bumper overhang area. Design note there, they've got the curb stops back, but of course they don't have edge protection on their pavement. If they were willing to spend 10 or 15 bucks a lineal foot to throw some curbing in there, they probably could have gotten more of a cell out of it, probably a little wider. Again, this is not a criticism, this is just an observation of different ways to approach the same design situation. So this is probably a lower cost, but maybe functionally sufficient way to go to have this size bioretention cell. But another way, if you want it to be more dense, uh, you could have made the cell wider, put curbs in there, and then maybe had weirs and stepped them down. But they uh, chose this approach where you're having a little more of a sloping uh, situation. So there's a lot of different ways that this can look. Here's some more examples out in Silverdale, looking at the YMCA where you're really looking at the pipes coming through. You can see on the left there, They've got a penetration through the sidewalk that looks like it's picking up the gutter in front of that silver car, conveying it down through that uh, river rock into the cell. One thing you can see is you can see how their beehive grate is sitting proud of, the, of that rock, which is really what we want to see. We want to see that ponding depth really provided, and we don't want to see the mulch right up to the rim. And that's very often when I'm doing my final punch list um, projects, that's a very common one. That detail, I think, just often gets missed in construction. Uh, crews tend to want to just fill it right up to the rim. So just an observation. Another example here from the East Coast, Villanova, Rain Garden Biotension Cell. And this one is a project uh, that I did back in 2007. This was one of the first bioretention to be downtown Seattle. And we worked with... Um, the architects and the landscape architects to put this road on a road diet. So we actually able to take Taylor Avenue, uh, which was a very generous street with angled parking, which, which was unnecessary for their traffic needs and tighten it up, creating this big plaza area. And then we built these pretty generous bioretention cells with the seat walls to activate the, the adjacent retail spaces. And so here's where the stormwater management is, is really central to the landscape architecture. It's completely stitched in. It's not an add-on or just a utilitarian part of the design. It's a real uh, celebrated part of the design. And that's when, that's when things get really fun. These seat walls uh, were actually a requirement uh, by SDOT, the Seattle Department of Transportation, to prevent pedestrians from falling in there. This was done uh, long enough ago that um, Anyway, th this was done yeah, in 2007. So anyway, it's really fun. The seat walls light up, there's bridges, and we also did a bunch of pervious pavement in there as well. <laughs>